Thank you all for coming. Uh, we're going to forego introductions if that's okay, right? I mean, just know that they're all brilliant. <laughs> Read the introductions because we only have 45 minutes of conversation. So um, let's just jump right into it, if you don't mind. What do you take to be the significance of bringing to the fore uh, of our understanding of the revolutionary period these particular voices? What is the significance of finding these voices? James, we'll begin with you and putting forward these voices. Well, thank you. Um, Eddie, the, the first thing I'd say is that, you know, the book is 200 texts from that period, we, most of which we lost track of or never seen before. And so I think of it as a, a reclamation project, a kind of reclaiming of these people and resurfacing them. But I also see the book as a kind of call to action that uh, there's so much we need to do. You know, if we can't name people in the revolutionary period, African-American people before 1800, we have a huge gap in our memory. And we need to change that. We can't name soldiers who fought in the American Revolution. We don't have monuments on the mall to any figures from this period. And yet 20% of the population was black. So it's a huge gap in our knowledge. And it really calls for us to do something about that. And Ed, what do you think? Well, the same thing. It rounds out the picture. You bring in voices of people who would be forgotten or who have been erased, essentially, because of the institution of slavery that kept black people from participating in creating records and so forth. And even enslaved black people didn't have the opportunities that, that whites did to be able to make their record, to keep a record of things. And so you don't have a picture of that world if you don't have everybody's voice. And you are, you know, they are who they were, but they're in, in relationship to other people. So they're not just, it's not just a, a story that's in a vacuum. You round out the picture for the beginning of America. We have been a part of this from the very, very beginning. And people know that, but this reiterates it. You can say that, you know, that these were people who were doing things, filing petitions, trying to make the world um, as you know, safe for themselves as they possibly could. And that's not a story. Black people kind of appear, for most of the historiography, until you know, the civil rights movement and so forth, they were sort of silent. It was like they, they weren't saying anything or doing anything. And this book shows that that's not true. Greg, what, what, do you, what do you think, Greg? Yeah, it, it, the, the voices are there. They were purposely uh, forgotten. They were pushed to the margin. They were not collected. They were effectively silenced. And that's not a silence we need to respect. That's a manufactured silence. Uh, Annette pointed the way when she did her work on Sally Hemings. Mm. That is just groundbreaking. And it, it really opened the door for work that other people did. And it, it's not complicated like Annette's work does. It's, you just take the shift away from the patriarchs, the white patriarchal culture. Just shift the camera lens a little bit, the material's there. Yeah. Tell that story. And that and James's, Jim's book is this great um, collection that is not out there, right? But now it is. And it was, it's in our records. It wasn't, it didn't, wasn't, it wasn't possible to disappear these people. They're there. We just needed to have the leadership and the intelligence to look for it. And this is what uh, uh, Jim's work does, uh, Annette's work, Eddie's. It's just, this is so exciting for that history that's there and now we can reach for and tell this story. Right, I mean, it, it's, it's so much, it's so important in the context of our current moment when, we're, when the question of history, America's past is so vexed. Mm -hmm. uh, there are folks who want to tell a story of the country that um, characterizes us or certain folks as latecomers, uh, yeah. Yeah. as the country is belonging to certain people and the rest of us should simply shut up and be grateful. When we begin to delve into the stories of this early period, there, there are these amazing, remarkable accounts. Greg, you do some amazing work in this regard. Talk a little bit about, I love this phrase, the theft of literacy, right? Talk a little bit about Hannah and what she did. And then we want to, trend, you know, you've already mentioned your indebtedness to Annette's work around Sally. We want to talk about this in relation to the archive, but talk about the theft of literacy, Hannah, and her, the importance of recovering that story. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. So Han Hannah's just uh, one of... Hold the book up, Jeff, so yeah, everybody sure. can see Life it. Yeah, there you go. Hannah Crafts. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, ha Hannah Crafts, she, she chose that name Hannah Crafts. She was an enslaved woman who um, 
who discovered literacy. She worked to have literacy. There was more literacy than we're aware of. There was a free-floating literacy. And just because historians, earlier historians, looked at the white set laws that said slaves couldn't have literacy doesn't mean that they didn't. Mm. Um, and the historical record is full of it if you're willing to look. If you're going to accept the history that the last two generations, last three generations, told us, then you're going to miss half the story. So this particular manuscript, that um, this uh, a woman named Hannah Bond, who was born in 1826 in Bertie County, North Carolina, wrote a novel that somehow came down to us. And it came down to us because those records are out there. This particular manuscript um, was, uh, was preserved by Dorothy Porter Wesley, this right. really important person. If you don't know, then you don't, if you want to know who kept the, these manuscripts and this history alive, she's one of those most important people. And she had this manuscript, and after her passing, it went to auction, and Henry Louis Gates Jr. purchased it at auction. He knew that Dorothy used to joke with him that she had something far more valuable than the manuscript he originally discovered, our Nick. So this literacy, I'm saying, is out there. It's recoverable, yeah. and that history is reachable. It's complicated by the way archives have been maintained, the way scholars have been trained to engage the archive. Um, Annette opened the door. I'm telling you, I read that book as soon as she <laughs> published it, and it just opened it up that we don't have to only take this one path to understand history. This other rich history, which she helped point the way to do, is completely reachable. It may take time. It has different archival threads. It takes a different type of scholarship that you might not have been trained to do as a PhD, but it's there. And you reach into communities and you do that work. Before we get to you, Yvette, about the archive and what you did with Sally, the Sally Hemmings story, I want to talk to Jim for a second about this, the literacy question, because what's so striking, how many documents, how many? Two, 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 I chose 200 texts. 200 texts. Hundreds more. Hundreds more. And this, these are folks writing. Yeah. So the writing black subject, right? The subject that, in some ways, this where literacy becomes a way to announce a particular kind of self. Yes. Right. A certain kind of word. And when reading the volume, you know, you come across these extraordinary stories—stories stories of being stolen at eight years old, theft. Not only, not just simply Phyllis Wheatley, but other st stories of of black men who fought in the wars as proxies who entered into particular contractual relationships with their masters with the idea if they survived the war, they would be manumitted and then failing to be manumitted. Yep. Talk about what it means to, to compile writing that gives us detail of the lives lived, the arguments made, yep. the claims put forward, yep. the subjects, the selves, yep. the people walking, this, walking the place. Well, it took 12 years to pull this together, Eddie, but that was the thrill for me. Um, the number of human beings whose life stories opened up, sometimes briefly, sometimes. There, there are 10 slave narratives here published before 1800. Before so we Douglas. Have, yeah, long before Douglas. So, and we've somehow forgotten all of that. Um, but to me, one of the joys of the book, in the 200 texts that are in it, there are at least 700 named individuals whom I think if we didn't have these texts, we would have no record of their existence whatsoever. And yet what we see them doing is every variety of human activity. So one of the conclusions I draw is that there are no generalizations possible. We have free blacks in the North uh, joining the American Revolution and fighting on the American side, some of them as proxies for their masters, some like Lemuel Haynes, mm -hmm. a member of a militia in Massachusetts who goes on to be a minister in a white congregation in the North. I mean, stories that you, you can't believe the sort of premises of them sometimes. They're so unusual. Others who went to the British side and actually fought for the British forces against their American masters, especially in Virginia and South Carolina, and eventually left with the British to Nova Scotia and on to Sierra Leone, uh, often founding whole new communities, religious leaders who founded the Methodist and Baptist faiths in Sierra Leone. So, there are many, many different stories here that have lain just below the surface, mm -hmm. and now I feel like we're, we're digging them up. Right, so Sally Hemings, anecdote. You get this story, I'm a descent, my, 
you know, the story of how this comes into view. Mm -hmm. I'm a descendant of such and such. Mm -hmm. Couldn't possibly be right. Mm -hmm. We trust the letters over here, but not the letters mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what it meant to enter into the archive with a certain skepticism in place mm -hmm. about the veracity of the black voice. Well, I mean, that was the, the purpose of doing the book because I was upset about the fact that there was this double standard in looking at people's evidence. And I understood that it was not just about a story about you know, Tom and Sally, that this is the way African-American people were treated, the story of African-American people, giving a perspective on, on our lives, and that that's dismissed because it's inconvenient. It made people feel bad. I mean, a lot of the stuff that, that's going on now with the fight against history comes from that, that same impetus to say, uh, we know the, they knew these things happened, but we want to hide it. And so the idea was to show how that process worked, how you discard the statements from African-American people that they didn't like, and they built up the stories from the white side of the family that they thought was, they were more palatable. And when you do that, when you ask them the question about literacy and the theft of literacy, mm -hmm. think about you know, if there were more. It's great that we have these voices, but the reason to keep them from doing this is to hide this notion of hiding what was done. And you know, the, the loss of the voices of those people means that you're telling a story that's incomplete, and an incomplete and one that favors the people who were enslavers, the people who were, in fact, you know, exacting this kind of control over African American people. So the moment, you, if you can show that, that creates skepticism about other things. I wanted people to when they were looking at other stories about African-American people, the idea that blacks didn't write mm -hmm. or had no literacy, mm -hmm. and so therefore there's no point in us looking for this stuff. This book just you know, knocks that out of the water because if you were able to find these things, who knows what else is out there? There's still things to be found. And not letting African-American people enter into the conversation was the whole point of doing that, hiding what they were doing. And so these kinds of books bring that to the fore. And people can think about it think about other things differently now. Yeah, my first book was entitled Exodus, Religion, Race, and Nation in Early 19th Century Black America, right, where I bridged uh, two subfields, uh, African American religious history and early American religious history and philosophy. And if I had Jim's book, right, because I was working with Absalom wow. Jones and Richard Allen, I was yeah. doing yeah. Uh, work uh, with uh, uh, early, early free black communities, the early black church mm -hmm. in those periods, working in newspapers, boy, if I had that collection. <laughs> the stuff around George Lyle, mm -hmm. yes. the connection between Lyle and South Carolina and, and Jamaica in mm -hmm. terms of uh, uh, the relationship there is just fascinating. But it's, it's, great, it's great for scholars, but it's great for young black people, I was people about to too. make that. It's for young black people as well. I mean, the, to be told that you have no history, to be told that they weren't doing anything. Black people were doing things at every single turn. turn. Every single, whatever crack was open, whatever th avenue that was open to them, they took it. And that's important for people to know. I would like to add to that because one of the things they were doing was participating in the political discussion around the revolution. So in this book, there are six texts. Within six months of the declaration being issued, where black writers claim, use the declaration as a basis for claiming civil rights for themselves. So the civil rights movement really has its genesis in this period with these people in some of their public and private writings and some of the things they were doing in their communities that were pressuring the white political establishment. And we've not seen that right. until these texts become visible. Absolutely. Now, making them visible is a, is a very difficult task. Let's, Greg, I want you to tell us a little bit about this extraordinary work that you've done in the archive. Um, what does it mean? I mean, there's a moment in Toni Morrison's Beloved when school teacher um, is let, you know, detailing the characteristics of Setha and others, right? And he just lists numbers, characteristics, right? That are, and so in the archive, sometimes we don't find the names of these folk. They're just chattel. They're, they're just listed. So what does it mean to try to find these folk? Uh, and, and, and what did you do in order to, how can I put this, um, hunt down Hannah and all the particulars? of this remarkable woman? Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting, interesting question. It, it, it's, 
it's a different type of scholarship. It's patience, mm -hmm. humility, and presence. So in uncovering Hannah Kraft's life story, that she was born as Hannah Bond in 1826 in Berkeley County, how did she gain literacy? It took a long time to piece together. And it wasn't me piecing together by reading just secondary sources. It was all primary sources, and that meant not sitting, I mean, I did a ton of work in the library, Carol, among different archives, but it meant going into the community and sitting and presenting in the community, being invited into people's homes. You have to build up trust in all sorts of communities, the communities of the enslavers that, that used to own these people, the communities of those who descended from enslaved people. So there's a time there. But what I want to say is how enriching that possibility is. Mm -hmm. We have this novel that became a bestseller in 2002 when it was first discovered. We didn't know a lot about it. Henry Louis Gates Jr. and a bunch of other scholars did great work. But there was so much more to know. And I'll just give you an example. It goes Please. back to literacy. Um, it's, it's contextual. It's, it's, it's a kind of cohort research. It has to be hyper-local. I learned a lot of this <laughs> from Annette. <laughs> I can't tell you how important that was to this work. But So I'll give you an example. Hannah Crafts, I was able to trace her, her um, what is in, in, in the enslaver's records. Then I had to dig out what's in her book. What's so rich about her life is we have, and it's very rare, a holograph manuscript. What that is, is the working copy that has her choices, her marks, her edits. It's all there in the materiality of the page. That is so rich for a biographer. And this is a person who is creating art, right? So you start there and you think, why is this novel so fascinating with Charles Dickens' Bleak House? Mm. Why is this novel how does she come up with this extraordinary scene where Hannah, the autobiographical person based on the author, um, passes a smelling bottle after putting whitening powder on Mrs. Wheeler's face and her face turns black? How do we, what's going on there? Well, if you dig into it, you see the genius of the literacy. The same reason we love to read Jesmyn Ward or Toni Morrison or what writers are doing, African American writers are doing now, she was doing there in the very foundational text. Here's a quick story. The Wheelers loved blackface minstrels. In research and in their diaries, I found who was the specific actor Mr. Wheeler loved particularly. And I found the, um, the riff on Uncle Tom's Cabin that this particular blackface actor wow. had pioneered. And what I realized after doing, piecing this together, that, that moment in the novel is building off of this brilliant woman who had to sit in a balcony and watch white people put cork on their face and mock enslaved people as greedy and foolish. She flips the script when she writes her narrative. Some of it's based on facts from the Wheelers, but she's not tied down to some abolitionist saying, you can't even use your fancy. It's got to be documented for everything. She, she doesn't care, right? She's going to uh, fabricate this beautiful story of Mrs. Wheeler. What would it look like if a white person was now black-faced? And she writes this in the show-stopping scene of the book. The other thing I'll just, I'll close with this. Her literacy was traceable because she served college students who were boarding at Wheeler House. And families keep the records of their school children. I was able to find the school records of the women that she was serving, what were their composition exercises. And you can see her growing literacy through a record that is, is reachable. It takes a while to get to it, but it's there. And that richness is in this no extraordinary novel. It's in the literature we love today. It's in the music we love today. And there's going to be more. There's so much more out there uh, to, to be discovered. It's an exciting time to think. So what do you do with an archive that that's expansive? Right? So it's not like a set of papers that you're working through <laughs> where you have to engage in this kind of broad detective work. Yeah. And you run into dead ends. People you find, they, you lose them. There's the end of the book where there are these people that you, you list. I don't know what happened to them. Right. They're, they're children who are sold. Yeah. I don't know what happened to them. What do you do, not with an archive that's 
that's limited. It's only so much available. Mm -hmm. But because you have to piece so many parts together, it's really expansive. Mm -hmm. what, what sorts of choices are you making as, as historians, as detectives of sorts? So the two things I'll say is that, uh, first of all, like all archaeology, you can't find something unless you're looking for it. So archives that people have been in for hundreds of years where this material was present, people just weren't looking for it. Mm -hmm. I mentioned 40 different historical archives and my research assistants and I consulted for this. And in some cases, there would be a file of uncatalogued manuscripts just labeled Africana. Hmm. And people go in there and find things. In other cases, we're finding pieces in newspapers where the writer clearly identifies him or herself as African American. In fact, the first time the phrase African American is used in American history is in 1782 in a, in a religious sermon here, which I'm, I'm sure you were interested in. But you have to be looking for these things. So, th and the second thing I'll say is, it's, this is a first pass. You know, I chose 200 documents. Mm -hmm. The frustration, as you allude to, is you get a window in on a life where someone is, is trying to free her children or, or trying to escape from slavery to join her husband in Philadelphia, and you don't know what happened. So the project is ongoing. And this, so the second thing I would say is this is a book that I want to hand off to the rising generation. And I want to see students. I want to see filmmakers. I want to see archivists. I want to see people in every field dig further, mm -hmm. flesh out these stories and add to them. What, what, what's your uh, response to the question of the archive, given what you had to do? Well, other than it can be a tedious process, <laughs> uh, you have to love what you're doing, and you have to, I think, be looking for it. You notice things, and I, and I didn't use a researcher, and I don't use a researcher, because the kinds of things that I'm doing, the kinds of things that I'm looking for, I don't think that other people would intuitively understand the significance of it, like names, for example. You know, when the, looking at Sally Hemings' children's names, you know, figuring out who they were, who they were named for. I mean, I could see those names, and when I, I'm in an archive looking at people's letters and so forth, I could say, oh, that's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a combination of, I, I think for me, liking detective work, liking doing the detective work, and really wanting to tell the story. But if you don't think these people are important, he's right. All of the stuff that I wrote about, all the things that have been written about Monticello um, and slavery, they were there. That material was always there. And generations of Jefferson scholars just didn't think it was important, didn't think these people were important. So they didn't pay any attention to it. And now, of course, it's the treasure trove of, what, uh, of that place and what... So I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna pin that because I wanna come back to that claim because it's important to our current moment. But I wanna go back to the archive and, and what's striking about how manic these people are. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an example. Greg, you were trying to locate which plantation? Hannah Crafts. Yeah. Right? And you came across paper, the specific paper that was being used. Explain that, because when I read it, I was like, this guy has to be, something's wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about how the particular paper used by the Wheelers led you to conclude that Henry Louis Gates might have not gotten something right. Sure, and this is a, this is a story of collaboration, right? It's it's the scholar, and that has no idea that some nerd down in North Carolina is just completely blown away by her work. This is the first time I had a chance to meet her. I'm so great. Can't um, you tell? You don't know the reach that you have, right? When you're doing important work, but it's intellectual work that is collaboration. It's it's what we do. People don't realize. You think, they think academics emerge into a library carol and the book springs from their head. That's their monograph that nobody wants to read and it goes, gets them tenure. That's not what generally we do, right? It's, it's, it's recursive. I remember reading Annette's book and she writes about how you have to come back to the work that you already did until you've lived in it long enough to really know what you're seeing. It takes, it takes a while, right? And it takes collaboration. So to the point of the, and I'm starting with that, um, I build off of what Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. did. 
And he is a collaborative scholar. He brought in forensic scientists to investigate the manuscript, and he writes about this when he first published it. And when he brought other scholars into it, he didn't block out people who were skeptical. Mm -hmm. And um, when I first started the research, I was somewhat skeptical. Right. Now, Dr. Gates has in his mind that I was out to prove him wrong. I was not. But, but the, it's, it's a collaboration. These early forensic scientists did work to draw to the attention of every reader who engages the book that there's something unique in which the way paper was created in the period where they could date the ink and the paper type between 1853 and 1861. Um, so what I obviously did is, this is fascinating. So there's a particular um, uh, watermark on the paper and a particular fiber that's used on the paper. I realized as I was doing this research, things were all pointing to a specific time and place when the manuscript was being written. I am going to spend as long as it takes to find every piece of paper circulating in and out of that household. My point. And, right? you know, I mean, and the, so real quick, like on the tenure clock, I, I was writing other books, right? Because that was not going to work for that world. But I, that, that's just. That's not like the, my passion in life wasn't to get tenure, right? it was to do work. So that um, allowed me to find finally in a little community college in Wentworth, North Carolina, there's a rare book room of Governor Ellis who used to be from that community and their letters that John Hill Wheeler wrote to Dr. Ellis at the uh, same time that Hannah Crafts, Hannah Bond at the time, that was her name, was in the household. And on the paper that um, Wheeler was writing on, you have a match to the same paper that the author is using to write the Bond woman's narrative. The author, um, his, this, so the enslaver, John Hill Wheeler, <laughs> it, this is, my, my son is here, and he, he loves uh, horror films, and it's the calls coming from inside the house, <laughs> right? We know from the physical material of that manuscript where to look. Mm -hmm. And this was a match with what we know from the forensic science of the manuscript to the paper that John Hell Wheeler was using. And you know, that doesn't tell you everything, but that is one really important step to putting the pieces together to understand the brilliance of this best-selling book that is just extraordinary in, in our, our American literature. And that's, and that's the important part about that is that, and you mentioned before, it's not using the letters. It's in compiling this stuff, you have to use whatever you can, archeology, span anthropology, psycho, you know, whatever tools that are available uh, to sort of excavate all these kinds of things. And this shows how it works, DNA, all of it, yeah. just pulling it together. This is, this is one of the challenges. You know, my colleague Tara Hunter was, you know, has written amazing work and you know, the first book on, on, on Washerwomen, there was a kind of narrow archive. The second book about black marriage <laughs> is all over the place, right? And so the choices you have to make when the archive is that expansive because it's not a narrow, narrow bonded uh, 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 set of papers, as it were, <laughs> because you have to kind of compile and cross-section and all this other thing. But pinning, I, wanted, I, pin, I pinned something earlier that you said and that, that I want you all to respond to. It was there. Some of it was, at least. Mm -hmm. Folk hadn't found the paper yet. <laughs> but it was there. Folk ignored it. And the ideology that informed why they ignored it still obtains. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're in one of those moments where the fever has spiked, <laughs> right? Almost a second redemption, yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? A kind of second lost cause, as it were. How does this work sit? I've asked it in the beginning. How does it sit in the moment where there's an ideology that actually blinds, blinkers, that leads folk to ignore? Right? What, do you, what do you hope this will do right, in this moment? Right? You, see, you see the question I'm asking? I do. Yeah. And I see the historical dynamics of it, of yeah. course. And I'm glad we're in a state where this book is legal. Exactly, Don. And can be taught in schools. But if you look at the pattern of history, um, when there was material that people didn't want to accept as eyewitness testimony, as evidence, 
they censored it. So all of the slave states in the early 19th century passed laws against incendiary literature. They censored it, which is a sign, really, of losing the battle of ideas. Because mm. you take violence against the ideas that you can't otherwise combat. Mm. I'm always interested in the fact that none of the free states had censorship laws. They were not afraid in Massachusetts. Somebody would say, well, let's bring back slavery. You know, it wasn't an idea that was going to prevail. But I always saw censorship as a sign of extremists, that you are, you know, you, you sense somehow that you're losing a battle, cultural and intellectual battle. There was a person like that in 1857 who wrote the Dred Scott decision, Justice Taney. And that's why I started my introduction with his effort to write African Americans not only out of citizenship, Dred Scott would be a slave even if he had lived in free states and so on, but he didn't want to see black people in American history. And he tried to deny that black people had been citizens, part of the body politic, and so on, in the Dred Scott decision, right at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, a deliberate act by, of course, the worst, one of the worst Supreme Court justices ever, um, to eliminate all of this history and eliminate the people who wrote it and about whom it tells a story. I think that's a, something we need to be aware of mm -hmm. as we look at our own moment. Yeah and think about where are these, where are these impulses coming from? Mm. What's the political force of them? Well, they've been there from the beginning. And the idea is to say that African-American people are not part of the polity, the American mm. polity. We, the people, we're not a part of that. And for a country that focuses and so much on the founding and the people, figures, certain figures in the founding, it's important for those people who want to do that, to write blacks out of it, to say that they had no part of it. They, they, were, they didn't write, they weren't participating, and this book just puts the lie to that altogether, yeah, so that they were there from the beginning. I just gave a talk recently at Dickinson College, and I reminded them that their alum, Justice Taney, gave us the Dred Scott decision. They weren't too happy about that reminder. But anyway, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I want to ask, I want to shift gears for a second, because, you know, these stories are always important on so many different levels. They're important, of course, in terms of the story we tell ourselves as a nation, particularly important in this moment where so many folks want to forget. But they're deeply, deeply personal stories in certain ways. Which text broke your heart when you read it? When you found, when you're moving through the archive and you came across something, which one broke your heart, gave you some insight into the depth of the cruelty of the moment? And then, which text gave you a sense of the possibility. Hmm. Look at them, look at each other. No, no, no. <laughs> you start. Well, the one that broke my heart, that many of them did. I mean, they, they are, uh, one by one, there are 200 stories in here, uh, many of which just kill you. But one that, for our country, um, just made me weep. 1799, 71 black men in Philadelphia sign a, a petition to Congress, which is, of course, sitting in the nation's capital, Philadelphia, asking for uh, an end to slavery, civil rights for black people. I reproduced the, the page that those 71 men signed here. Only 20 of them were literate and could write their own names. The other 51 made their mark with an X and then got somebody to fill in their name. They wanted their names on that petition in 1799 which was not an easy thing to do. It was dangerous. Potentially, many of those men were uh, escaped from slavery in, in, in recent times. They were exposed. Any man could be taken or woman taken back into slavery illicitly. As we know, well into the 1850s, that was happening. So the bravery of doing that in a city where we celebrate 56 men signing the Declaration of Independence, that was an act of bravery. Here are these 71 men I had never heard of until maybe five years ago when I found this petition, mm -hmm. putting their lives on the line to put a petition in front of Congress, which Congress actually debated for two days and then voted down 85 to 1. 85 to 1. I think it's the greatest lost opportunity in American history. Congress had the chance to do something at that pivotal moment and blew it. So that's the one that hurts the most. Um, there, are, there are many you know, that are, that are uplifting. Uh, 
Lemuel Haynes writing against slavery inspired by the Declaration of Independence and he is still a serving soldier in the American army. He's gonna go on to the Battle of Ticonderoga and yet the minute the Declaration comes out, we remember that Washington asked that his officers read the Declaration to the troops. Well, he was among them. He instantly applied the Declaration to the question of slavery. And if, he, if, he, if his message had been taken up, and it's a beautifully written essay, which I, I'm sure you've seen, um, think how history might have changed. But it was such a, a brave thing to do, and it was so eloquent, and it speaks to the intrinsic idealism of the Declaration and how far short of it, mm -hmm. with all due respect to our, our friend Jefferson, how far short of it we have been <laughs> for centuries. <laughs> So uh, with Hannah Crafts, when I was researching, um, she was born as Hannah Bond, and uh, I discovered a moment um, in 1852 when she was shown to have a child. Um, this was profound because that child disappears. There's nowhere else in the record. And all the other contextual evidence for her life was demonstrating, as Sally Hemings knew, uh, the, uh, through her, her mother and herself were raped as part of the way these plantations were working. There were records of the plantation right next door with the same activity going on. That was extremely heartbreaking for me. But what's so, um, what was so compelling in tracing the life, her story was not about that. She didn't even write any, that it's, it's reflected in other ways. That's, it's, it's a real mission of her novel to, to tell the story of those rapes, but the, it's not about victimization. Mm. It's not about enslavers' power. It's about the triumph of the enslaved to escape mm. and tell their own story, to have fun and play, to flip the script, to demonstrate this nourishing life. So what was amazing to me was, in my research, I found that Hannah Craft's mother was forced to move away. She was separated at the age of nine. Um, she escaped slavery after being orphaned and entered into a marriage where there was a son who was 10 years old that she adopted. The, when she lost her mother, she became a mother to a 10-year-old, and on her deathbed, that important figure was with her. They lived together until her end. Um, there's a way in which the horrors that are documented in history are not the story. Yes. And this is what I think we're all interested in, right? In writing about. The, the, the story extends that. It's not the story of enslavers' power. It's the story of human power, mm. human dignity, human genius, human glory. I mean, it's, it's, what, it's why you do this, right? Like you, it's what's so inspiring about digging into history. So you can't, in my view, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Somewhere in Florida, they just um, put the Bond woman's narrative on a list that you can't read. Exactly. <laughs> that's just going to encourage some Floridians to read it, who would otherwise be like, oh, that's old. I don't want to read that. So I, I don't think it's going to be successful. It doesn't mean that we don't have to fight that all the time. But it's that this, and this is the problem with the people who are trying to shut things down. They don't understand they're shutting down the best part of humanity. Mm. It's what we're all inspired by. It should be what they're embracing. It's what would help them win elections. And what right? they fear their children will embrace. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that's, exactly. I mean, they don't want their children identifying with those people. They want them to keep the same prejudices and so forth. So that's why you have to, to hide that. Yeah. Well, we want to open it up for questions. I've already taken four minutes of your time. I apologize. <laughs> but I had to ask that question. I think it's really important for us to understand that even within the context of slavery, even within the context of the brutality of slavery, people still lived. Mm. They still lived their lives, mm -hmm. which means they experienced joys, they experienced sadness. Uh, as Jessamyn Ward said to me, she said they could actually retreat, not, she just said recently, they could retreat to a space where they love the sun. That's what she was talking about, mm -hmm. she heard from Ta-Nehisi Coates, right? There are still human beings in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. And part of our effort is to kind of what? uncover it yeah. as best we can. So we have mics here. Now look, there are only a couple of rules. You're going to ask a question. Ask a damn question. <laughs> okay, so Tim, please. Good. Is it on? I think it is. I think it is now.
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, on. Why was this material preserved? You would think if I'm so criminal in a way, maybe because I don't realize that I'm criminal, that I'm doing all this bad stuff, enslaving people, and you know, and all this evidence is here. Why didn't they destroy it? Why did they save it? Why did they preserve it? Why? I mean, I know you had to go dig really deep, but all these materials talk about the pain, the torture, and everything else, and, and we live in modern times where you want to ban it, but why did, it wasn't black people who were saving, I'd imagine, it was these you know, sort of white institutions that preserved all this material. Why do you think they preserved it? If that's a fair question, I don't know. Well, I would tee it up, Tim, just to say that, uh, first of all, um, you only destroy material if, if you think what it shows is wrong. But if your mindset is this is everyday life, um, there's no, nothing embarrassing about this. You don't mind it staying in the family records or, or, or wherever. Um, I think there are people like Justice Taney who want to, you know, blank it all out. If he'd been an archivist, I'm sure he would have destroyed, you know, a lot of paper. He tried orally in his argument to just obliterate several hundred thousand people and the record of their existence. But I think part of it is that material gets saved at a time when people do not agree that slavery or racism is wrong. So it's there. Well, I mean, Jefferson kept a farm book with all of his information in it, and we ask questions of this material that he probably didn't, first place he didn't think we would be interested in it. I think he would be astounded to know that there are people who know every single one of the, the people enslaved at Monticello and their family histories and all of this kind of stuff, because he didn't think that that would have been important. Now, of course, there, when he dies and there are a bunch of letters um, that his family is compiling and they're going to sell his letters uh, to you know, help pay debts and so forth, I mean, they do destroy stuff. Mm. I mean, there are things, be, and we know this because he kept a list of all of the letters he sent out and le all the letters that came in. And so you can see, like, their letters to Robert Hemings, Sally Hemings' brother. They corresponded after Robert is freed. Those letters are gone. Mm -hmm. And um, so they do destroy things, but some of the stuff, they don't think it, you didn't think it was going to be, that I would be asking the kind of questions I asked, and other people did as well. So they don't think it's a, it's a problem. Yeah, uh, so it's a very similar story in the Wheeler. The Wheeler family passes down a story that's um, celebrated in Murfreesboro that they um, manumitted their slaves and sent them to Liberia. It's a lie that they wrote in the, two, two Wheeler family members wrote two different histories of North Carolina that were taught in North Carolina public schools for uh, almost 100 years. And that record's wrong, it's a lie. It's what you would hear if you went to Wheeler House and tell recently. Right, um, and it's, um, in fact, there's record in, because they were valuable, enslaved people were valuable, uh, people didn't think that was wrong to record it, but they had to record it because their value was so extraordinary. The irony is, yes, their value was so, so extraordinary. Why they couldn't be a racist because of how valuable and wonderful they were, how they produced the things that transcended into the wealth that built the country. So. That couldn't get erased. There is a moment afterwards where it's being hidden, right? And not, and this is the forces that are trying to ban. It's not going to win. That history is too powerful. It's too real. It's too human. It's too triumphant to, to, to destroy. Mm -hmm. We have a minute and 36 seconds for another question. Any of the students? I see y'all. Look at all of your heads just popped up. <laughs> We're delighted you're here. You just made me smile just looking at you. We're delighted you're here. Any other questions? Look, it's important for us as we take the time to, gra to grapple with this amazing work, with what Greg has done and what Jim has done and what Annette has done. I want you to go out and buy their works, but to understand we live in a complicated world, a world where there's suffering everywhere. And even in the midst of that suffering, people are telling stories. People are living their lives. And it's our task, if we're going to keep track of the humanity of all of us, right, to keep track of those stories, all right? Enjoy the book festival. <laughs> <laughs>